Yes, folks, here we are live, and we have with us tonight uh, the lovely Andrew Shearer, but he is not here as the Spoiler Room crew member this time. He is here as my guest because over the time and course that he's been in the Spoiler Room, he's had many a story, and I am uh, talking about films and indie filmmaking and other aspects, and I wanted to just have sit down with Andrew and do a little interview here with uh, him and he was very kind enough to agree to it so the lovely Andrew Shearer thank you for joining me Andrew and sitting down and wanting to talk about indie films and your films and uh, you know whatever else we come up with because it's not like I ever write down questions for my interviews so how you doing sir hey that's the way to go I'm good man I'm honored to do this I was honored to be asked uh, you have done some specs on the show and to be one of them is just like oh why <laughs> but, you know, it, it, I forget sometimes because I lead this dual life of of uh, of movie critic, but also as as of my hobby, movie maker. And um, I'm like, you know, remember that commercial? You could learn a lot from a dummy. <laughs> like maybe somebody could learn something from me. Buckle your safety belt. Use a uh, tripod. <laughs> <laughs> yes, number one rule: use a tripod. <laughs> oh God, broke that one for a few years. Oh, did you? <laughs> Um, there's a, one of my old movies. I'm kidding you not, because I'm putting together this Blu-ray of all my stuff from like the early, like the pre-YouTube days. Basically, um, it's a Blu-ray not because we shot on high def, but because there's like five hours of it. But like, um, there's one shot that's like really shaky. You see the box of the for the tripod in the shot. <laughs> we just didn't even take it out of the box. <laughs> We're too excited to make a movie. Didn't even take the tripod out of the box. Oh. Now, you've been making films a long time, not just, uh, you know, for Gonzarific, but I mean, uh, when, when did you start picking up the camera and, and, and making visual stories? Well, I was in videos before I was making them. So really, the beginning of it is like the 80s when my dad had a cam. He, well, he only had it for a little while. He had a lot of things just for a little while. Like there was an electric guitar and an amp, but just for a little while. And there was like a new car, but just for a little while. You know, there was all these things we had, but only yeah, I imagine he didn't have the money to pay for it. <laughs> he got it on some kind of credit thing and had to give it back. But for yeah, for a little while we had a VHS camcorder and being filmed on that, I could not wait to like act a fool in front of the camera, take it inside, pop the tape in, and watch what I just did. That just I've kind of haven't gotten over it, have I? I'm 41. Haven't gotten over it. But um, yeah, I had um, just whatever relatives are around like age eleven or twelve. Um, usually my aunt Jane, some you know holidays, she'd bring over the camcorder and fully intend on filming precious family moments with many people who have since passed. But that never happened because I would take it and make some stupid movie with my cousins instead. So no home movies for her. Just my uh, my on the fly made up trash. So yeah, probably age twelve or so, twelve, eleven or twelve. Those were probably more entertaining because, in all honesty, I I don't know many out there who sit down just one night and go, ah, I think I'm just going to watch a family tape from 1991. Uh, you know, you have these memories. I've got a whole stack of them, and I got to transfer to digital ev eventually. But, you know, what you did, it sounds a bit more interesting, uh, a lot more interesting, actually. <laughs> than, well, I mean, it's, it, it alleviates the awkwardness. I mean, that's why we were filming that stuff. It's not because... You know, we had any dire need to document the family. Really, you're just like, you know what will give me something to do instead of talking to these assholes? This video camera. <laughs> well, yeah, because you get in a family setting like that, especially as a kid. And you go through the questions of how school, how are you doing? And then that's about it. And then you sit there awkwardly as the grownups talk. And then you're just sitting there going, I finished my food now. What, what the hell am I going to do? Yeah. Did you know that's how sports began? Sports began because uh, people got really bored and awkward at family gatherings. And so they started throwing stuff around. <laughs> so it said, hey, we should maybe come up with some rules for this. Yeah. And, and, and it became this thing where like, hey, you know what we should do now that we've seen each other and caught up for two minutes? Let's look at that sport thing again. <laughs> No, no, Grandma, don't beat Billy with that bat. Here's a ball instead. <laughs> That's the origin of sports. I made that up, but I'm. It's got to be accurate. It sounds good. We'll we'll toss it on the wiki. See if it gets approved. Yeah, we're putting it down on the internet, so you know it's the truth. 
<laughs> That's the truth. Now, uh, you mentioned uh, music as well, and you have in some of the past episodes. Uh, you've been in abandoned stuff as well, haven't you? What's uh, kind of your musical background? That was my video camera um, that I eventually got. Like, actually, my a couple of my relatives went in on an actual video camera for me, so I'd quit borrowing and possibly destroying you know other people's um so yeah one one uh one christmas and my dad my uncle and i forget who else all went in on a camcorder with me it only lasted two years though we broke it because we made uh, about 40 tapes just full of stuff and um, wow. my best buddy uh from across the street that was uh doing a lot of the movies and shows with me you know you always have that enabler when you're a kid like just <laughs> one person that doesn't think you're a complete dork you know and usually they're a complete dork too and you somehow survive by being dorks together um mm -hmm. he met yeah he met a guy that played uh, guitar and knew who guar and gg allen were and the black flag and all this stuff and so um because i had long hair i was asked to sing in a punk band so that <laughs> that that ended up like snowballing into 10 years of my life i had no camcorder was not making movies but was playing yeah punk rock instead i went from like singer to guitar player to bass player i was a drummer in one it just like you know but it, it was a it was a good education though because it really informed like the way i would approach everything in terms of like do-it-yourself filmmaking and also um getting into uh counterculture and subculture things through zines learning about like weird cult movie you know it just it, it made me uh it made me like a solid weirdo i would say being in punk rock for 10 years yeah it's interesting you say that because uh our, our mutual friend Derek Carey, as well as some other indie filmmakers I've talked to, it always seems like indie music, you know, a garage band, underground band, punk band type uh, background, and indie filmmaking go together. Why, why do you think that is? Is it the guerrilla mentality of it? Is it the rebelliousness of it? What, what do you think is the reason? It seems like those two kind of go hand in hand with a lot of indie filmmakers. All that stuff you said. It's all that yeah. stuff. Um, you know, anything that's like uh, not made for mass consumption is very special to the people that find it, you know? And mm -hmm. so any like weird band we'd run across or any band we'd see is like, you know, if only two people like it, the less people even heard of it, the cooler it is, you know what I mean? For some <laughs> reason. But it also, it gave you more pride in it. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it, it just meant more and you worked harder for it. And you know, there's there's also a context if someone's like um, a garage band or not the software, but actual band in the garage or just like, you know, um, the punk rock and all that stuff. If there's an acceptance of, you know, what would amount to like garage band and garage music. But when it comes to films, which is what I make is punk cinema, garage cinema not uh not the same kind of understanding for it We're, you know it, it, it's it's not taken as seriously people are like somehow you know a guy who's playing like a cheap half broken guitar and screaming is somehow cool and legitimate but a bunch of people that are using a half broken tripod and running around the, and screaming their uh you know their amateur mm -hmm. script and whatnot with no lights and stuff that's somehow has less merit than a than a garage band does for some reason but uh it made me want to do it even more i think because of that it's like <laughs> what it's, it, it, to me it was more punk than being in a band was making movies <laughs> well especially uh micro budget uh low budget cinema uh films you know i can see that uh definitely kind of uh, an equivalent there but you're right about the acceptance because i mean i'll i'll review indie films online on youtube and that and some of the comments i get all oh, this looked like crap or this you know this and that and i'm just like yeah but did you actually you know pay attention yeah there's some good stuff in there i mean do you think there's this stigma that I, is it maybe because it's a visual medium versus like music you're just hearing it so it makes it a little bit more acceptable whereas being the visual medium people just have this underlying subconscious expectation of what it's supposed to be like in order to be good yeah i do and um there's really still no kind of context for low budget movies the way there is for um lo-fi music you know because like in punk rock for example no punk would come up to you and go like oh yeah what brand guitar do you play 
But in in <laughs> movies, everyone wants to know what branded camera to use. What do you shoot on? No one in music cared. Like, oh, what patch cord do you? Have? You know what I'm saying? And those you got some like really crazy, uh, interesting sound with a combination of pedals that you use, effects pedals or something like that. Never did you hear that. And especially, you never got this thing where like, dude, hey, uh, my name is Blase Skippy in the and the Dookie Jumpers. We want to be booked at your club. Oh, really? Well, um. How much did your drum kit cost? You know, so like those, <laughs> that's not even a thing. So if if the rules, if the rules, I say rules in quote marks, if the stigma of on low budget movies was applied in mass and in our culture to uh, bands that were also on the same uh, level or whatever, the history of music would be so so different. <laughs> that's that's the truth. <laughs> It, you know, I, I just never understood. Now, I will admit, when I was younger, um, I didn't quite have as much appreciation. I liked the cult film type stuff, but like the really low independent budget, the low budget type stuff, um, similar to films that you made, I didn't quite have an appreciation for. And then I went to the one horror fest, the Ashkash Horror Film Fest that uh, our good friend Glenn pointed me out to. And man, I learned so much about the culture. I ended up meeting filmmakers and, and making friends in that and realized, holy crap, these are my people. Yeah. <laughs> of sorts, you know? I yeah. like it. And, you know, you learn so much. And, you know, and that's what I find amazing. And I love about your uh, films is that uh, one of the things that I think sometimes is missing in some indie films, but people miss the point is, you have people having fun. Y your films all seem like you guys are just having a good time. <laughs> you want to know a secret? We are. Nice. Um, there is a, a distinction needs to definitely be made between uh, independent film and underground film, which is what we do. And what right. we definitely let everyone know that we are uh, because um, you know the, the underground is... Um, is not indie there is no aspirations to climb the ladder and eventually get into like hollywood circles or a film industry of any kind this is uh done for completely different reasons and i could say it's like for art or whatever but we are entertainment but we are entertaining ourselves each other our friends you have to remember that i was doing this before i had any idea anybody but us would see it um, mm -hmm. that the Blu-ray that I'm getting going to be putting out later this year, uh, well, I say later this year, hopefully in December, I've got it authored, um, is called Mondo Gonzo underground films, 2003 to 2015. They were all done, um, before YouTube was a thing. And mm -hmm. before I had a DVD burn, before I had PayPal, and definitely before I had any idea that like something like amazon you know the people in other countries i had no we had no idea any of that would happen we were purely making movies for the fun of doing it and for the sake of creating it and for the the, the thrill of seeing something you thought of come to life you know and uh so that really is the reason behind what we do and i never i never had any desire to not make movies for those reasons and, and that's awesome reason. And yeah, I, I do use the word indie, but yeah, you're right. It, it is the distinction between underground and independent cinema. And uh, I, just in my case, you know, other well, ones consider themselves, themselves indie because, sure. you know, like, hey, some of those guys at that film festival, JP Moneybags might come up and go, hey, what would you do with $500,000? And they'd be like, oh, I've got this idea for the Chronicles of Riddick 8. But I... <laughs> I would be like five hundred thousand dollars. I could make a million movies. <laughs> I could make a hell of a lot of movies for that. Exactly, I could make a a movie a day for the you know. I would. That's. I've had people ask me that before. So mm -hmm. it depends. You can label yourself indie, or you can call yourself underground. And some people say the underground doesn't exist, but I disagree. It is. I think bigger than ever. Well, and and that is help with the internet and YouTube. You're getting uh, this material out there to more people uh, that you wouldn't have had 20 years ago. Uh, you know, and you're just putting it out there to put it out there. And I think, do you think uh, sometimes people 
misinterpret intentions? I mean, you th- you think say your casual viewer who listens to you know the term underground, you know, what wh- what do you think they're thinking of what type of film that is because when you say underground it, and I think the stereotype of what's associated with it and like the f- type of films you make are completely different in a way. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So, you know, you know, uh, I guess with underground, I mean, uh, where do you think that comes from that, that stigma that of what underground actually is? It's um, we're just a whole entire, a couple generations removed from anybody that would even be able to like know an example of one of those and have seen one of those, mm-hmm. you know, because at one time, you know, someone like uh, John Waters, for example, was an underground filmmaker, but you know, he continued in film industry and, um, you know, cl- climbed up through that. And he, he became an independent filmmaker and, you know, at one point a studio filmmaker too, you know, he made two movies for a uh, universal. And so, um, I, I think it, yeah, it definitely comes just not having any context for it. They can't imagine it. They don't know like, where, where would you watch them? Would you watch them like in a bunker somewhere <laughs> or whatever? Um, but also there's this thought of like, well, this, if this person or persons had any real talent, then they would be climbing that ladder and this film would be a million dollar movie and it would be playing in the multiplex down the street from me or they could get a deal with netflix if they were talented enough they don't necessarily think that about music although some people do you know i had Mm -hmm. friends that i play the ramones for them and be like oh god these guys are remedial he can't play Mm -hmm. you know and but a lot of people hearing punk or hearing rock and roll would, would think that too. They're like, wow, that does not sound like a Gibson gold top Les Paul to me. Turn it off. <laughs> that wasn't shot out of red. <laughs> nope. Oh, there are those people. There are definitely those people. And they have made some of the most boring movies I've ever seen. <laughs> well, one could say definitely uh Gonzarific makes uh, movies, if anything, for the titles of your films um yeah you know where can those come up do you just just sit at one day and go ah you know what uh vincent price's skull (laughs) Uh, where do you get come up with the ideas for it you just sit and brainstorm one day or i'm usually i'm like well there's a lot of people in the crew of the um that write and direct not just me Mm -hmm. um but i i definitely am you know kind of like the caretaker of it and so but the ones that yeah the ones that i direct are the ones that i write uh yeah usually title first honestly i um i don't know where that kind of comes from it's just i think um sometimes i'm when i'm walking sometimes i'm in an elevator a staircase um shower things like that or just you know out talking and seeing things or, you know just just uh, being places reading stuff watching movies and you know the other we're shooting for this anthology that i'm doing now um, and the host of the anthology is like a, 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 a like a, a radio, um, like late night love advice kind of um, mm-hmm. radio host. And we shot all this stuff, and I still don't have a title for this thing. And then once she finishes, and I'm looking at the footage, I just go, "Hot mic," and I'm like, "IMDb has anyone used hot mic?" No, and I'm like, Psst. "You know what I mean?" So. <laughs> But I love that cult film tradition of like sorority babes in the slime ball bolorama, you know, <laughs> slave girls from beyond infinity. This is my version of that because I'm a big fan of those old, you know, what would be considered psychotronic, you know, movies that really have no genre. They're just like, what is that? Exactly. I don't want the title to necessarily tell you what to expect. And then mm-hmm. if you're disappointed, that's your fault. <laughs> what type of movies uh are your influences you draw from you've mentioned john waters you've mentioned you know uh, movies with uh, the cult films with interesting titles uh, uh do you have any standout like your go-to ones that you kind of use for inspiration say before you're shooting a film before i make a movie there are a few that i always sit down and watch now a lot of times if i'm like you know what i i was i really want this movie to kind of be in the vein of this oh yeah i'll shove like all of that in my head uh, when i made dr humpenstein's erotic castle <laughs> i watched um a lot of something weird stuff you mm-hmm. know a lot of those releases orgy of the dead was basically my blueprint for that but there's other times where 
things from um, something like uh, uh, Blue Streak with Martin Lawrence will will creep its way in. I stole an entire gag from the movie Blue Streak, uh, uh, starring Martin Lawrence um, in Vincent Price's skull. There's a character that I wrote for Ice Cube to play, except for a, a woman plays it. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so you really just it's a it's um you really never know when it's going to come from. But the movie I always watch before we make anything is a documentary by Jennifer M. Crute, and it is called It Came From Kuchar. This is a documentary about the Kuchar brothers, and they made underground films in like the 60s and 70s, and it is such a validating experience to watch this crazy old fart making movies with old and young, and they're full of monsters and aliens and just on-the-fly plots, and he just he realizes what he's done later like after there's no big vision it's just like in in the moment filmmaking and knowing that someone made a documentary about him it fills me with just all the energy i need <laughs> and that is i watch that movie several times a, a year well that's cool well there you go folks you need to put that one on the list that definitely sounds uh interesting and in, in giving insight in in underground cinema because they, they, you know, you look at it, it's actually been around. I think people don't realize that it's been around longer, probably about at the time that they invented film. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, the, you know, the studio system is just one way of making movies, just like now um, the uh, major record labels are just one way of uh, making and distributing music. You know, the, the playing field is so wide open now, whatever it is you're looking for, it's out there and whatever it is you want to make, you know, by all means, if you want to go to Pixar University and end up with your film, your short playing in, before one of those movies and then uh, eventually graduate to directing one of them, um, that's a way to go. And I'm a fan of that kind of stuff. And I, you know what I mean? But uh, you don't have to. Mm -hmm. um, I never, I never thought about going to um, film school and moving to Hollywood, any of that stuff. I, and the the more time goes by and the easier it is for me to do this stuff, you know, with basically your phone, uh, <laughs> the, the less reason there is, you know, I have to go, well, am I a storyteller? Some people are. Am I a visionary? Some people are. I am not. I'm absolutely not. I just want to see wild stuff happen. And I also want to uh, be, as an artist, uh, critical of um of you know things aspects aspects of culture and society that that uh that bother me and that's probably the punk in me and i don't want to get involved with anything that's going to make me kind of lose or compromise that yeah and that's what i find interesting uh as well is that it, it seems like the, by doing underground cinema or uh you know some indie films not a huge amount but some of them as well without having that studio uh, kind of noose or whatnot or producers hovering over you you can have your voice and speak out about things that uh um, bother you and uh you've you've mentioned it on our episodes quite a bit and i know you're vocal as well you mentioned that you make uh feminist films um, yes be because you uh uh you are a feminist as well and i was wondering if you wouldn't mind maybe possibly giving our listeners possibly a, a definition or, or what you uh, categorize, you know, what makes uh, your films a feminist film? Because I think that term is so used as a stigma nowadays, as a negative connotation in a lot of circles. They're like, oh, feminist. Well, you know, you know, so what, how would you describe your films as, as why they're feminist films? I take, um, I, I, I definitely take an approach that's informed by um, my time as a volunteer uh, or at a rape crisis center, my time playing in bands that would be considered riot girl bands, um, and a lot of this other stuff. But my conversation really is with other men. I want men to see a man call himself feminist, and I want m men to see uh, a man making movies with and ab about female characters and taking that programming that guys like me and you and a lot of other ones have from all those years of like Skinamax and 
magazines and music videos and all of this other stuff where our images of women and what is beautiful and sexy and who has got permission to behave and look and act a certain way in movies and call that into question and become upset about what you know we men i don't think realize that the patriarchy done something to you too it may not have like actually oppressed you <laughs> you know what i mean it may not have like ostracized you and left you out of things and worked against you but you should be really angry at the things that it has done and the stuff that is created and and uh you know work with me to to kind of go against it we have all kinds of ages and uh shapes and sizes of people in my movies and the older I get, I am not going to stop making movies like wet t-shirt zombies. I'm not going to look for younger women to be in them. We're all going to be doing this until we're old or some of them quit. Because I think when people see someone that is like fat or old or whatever, running around acting like a scream queen or something or doing the things that, uh, you know, modeling or what we supposedly are only a certain type of person that looks a certain way is supposed to do that tells them not unlike uh with you know the low budget movies and stuff that tells them like oh wait there's something wrong with this because it's not what i've always seen it's not what i've maybe ever seen well now you've seen it because you've seen my movie <laughs> you know <laughs> So I, that's, but that, that's not a thing of me going like, Hey woman, I'm on your side or Hey woman, this is for you. That's not it at all. I come out with a movie called space boobs in space and some white straight dude clicks on it going like, ho, 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 a big titty movie for me. Why does he think that? Because of years of people making those movies for him trying to get his money. Ta-da, I don't want your money. I don't care. I don't want that guy's money. But I do want to talk to him. <laughs> I do want to show him something. Whether or not he gets it, you know, that's ultimately up to him. But it's, um, uh, yeah, I, I put the feminist label on there because I want people to know if it pisses you off or makes you afraid, good. <laughs> well, it's funny you mentioned the uh, mentioned that as well, the patriarch, because I, I in the last few years as I've gotten long in the tooth because uh, I'm I'm 43, uh, you know, I start to see in the world differently and people could say whatever woke or whatnot. And, and I realize some things in myself, you know, what what's acceptable and what's not and what I've been told over the years, especially like men showing emotion of any kind. Yes. Um, you know, or what toys to play with. And that's one thing that. I am quite happy with my my boys on is that um we didn't raise them to say oh you can't play with that because of this um you know and it showed through because uh when my kid was really young my son he liked playing with poly pockets yes he loved it he had a buddy over once and his buddy said what are you playing with Polly Pockets? This girl's toy. And he goes, I'll play with whatever I want. <laughs> exactly. You know, and here he had Polly Pockets going with G.I. Joe's and my Star Wars figures and that, you know, and just playing with them because he liked the miniature detail on the figures. And we didn't say, no, you can't play with that. You know, and that's kind of the feeling, if you don't mind me saying, it's kind of the feeling I get with your films. <laughs> is, yeah. is kind of that similar like this is okay people will do this you know yeah you, you know there's all shapes and sizes and, and they can all work together they all have talent uh the, i mean the crew that you have you've been working with the same crew for a number of years now haven't you yes yeah um it's uh definitely like the last six years has been um pretty much a, a steady uh core crew that i've gotten um but i you know, I always stuck with just friends. I never held an audition. I never looked at headshots. Uh, I think I only ever got one, and it was, boy, the one of the worst mistakes I ever made. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I play it close. I treat it kind of like a, a family sort of a thing. I've got, you know, I've got a job. And so this is uh, something I do, yes, for hobby because I'm interested in film and want to make it. But um, I have... Um, 
had the good fortune, the luck, of um, meeting like-minded artists that understand what it is I'm doing and think it's really cool and have never um, necessarily been able to be a part of something like that. Um, it is theater people, uh, it is um, musicians, it is visual artists, it is roller derby players, and it is also, uh, to a large degree now, uh, burlesque performers, which is wonderful to me because that is something that I feel, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s was a big part of cult film, definitely a sexploitation film. Um, but in like the age of porn and uh, eight, like 80s, 90s, 2000, kind of got lost and there, there's not that same crossover that there used to be. So um, I'm really, really dig that because a lot of their aesthetic, especially uh, new burlesque, very, very similar to Gonzarific's aesthetic. It, it is. And, and there's been a growing, I think over the last, I'd say five or 10 years, a growing scene in the burlesque again um which is great which is amazing and your films do play out kind of like burlesque because like you mentioned space moves in space you click on it and you're not going to get <laughs> what you think you're going to get because you think you're going to get extremes amounts of nudity and and exploitation type factor and you get hints of it much like a burlesque show but you don't get the full thing much like a burlesque show <laughs> yeah it is not called space areola or space nipple <laughs> you know <laughs> so again i you know we have plenty of what would be human flesh <laughs> but i you know there's the it's the thing if you want the old way of making those movies by all means go get you one mm -hmm. there's thousands and there's many places to go. If you've never seen an areola or a nipple, I'm sorry, I cannot be responsible for educating you on that. You cannot <laughs> hold me to that. Yeah. Um, I love sex exploitation film, and I think coming at it from a punk perspective and a feminist perspective has been, uh, it makes all the sense in the world to me because mm -hmm. it is a tradition that is problematic for sure. Um, and a lot of times you watch those movies and go like, well, now what, what would, what would a film be like if those women were, instead of just being paid for the day to get naked, maybe we're the writers and directors and producers of this stuff. And, um, I've answered that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because a lot of, uh, the films like in space boobs and space, which is, uh, it, it, anthology film. You have uh, your wraparound story with space boobs in space, but you also have a number of your shorts in there. Uh, a lot of them directed and shot and created by female artists. Yes. Um, it, you know, it's not just Andrew Shearer's show. Uh, mm -mm. These, this features a lot of work by a lot of talented individuals who, in all honesty, probably it, it, still today's world. And yes, I, I, going to get on a soapbox here in today's world and uh, you agree andrew that still don't get the opportunities probably you know as nearly as much as they should uh, it's a boys club a lot of it's a boys club still thankfully changing um has been changing but um music was the same way mm -hmm. you know you like you see a, a girl with a guitar case woman with a guitar case and People are like, oh, you're carrying that for a guy. You're not going to get on stage and play that. And it's amazing that that would be a mentality, but a lot of times it is because, you know, but, but you've got a lot of very fragile, very insecure dudes that, you know, want to say, well, like, this is a technical thing and therefore I'm the only one that could use it. Stay away, lady. Let me work the camera. <laughs> Yet you have uh, some of the best, like, death metal bands and even everyone's, you know, guar have female leads you know or female members who you know run circles around many of their male counterparts yeah yeah dude just there's just the men have a very thin skin and um any anybody getting anything means somehow to them it's taken away from them or it's doing being done against them somehow and um you know that's not the case um it's it's there are a lot of men do really dig what Gondorific is doing. They really kind of do understand that this is movies of, of the future. And they're definitely informed by movies of the past. Cause I do not want to see 
the cult film of the past, which is my favorite. I think like for me, the seventies were the best. Um, I don't want to see that die out, but in order for me to make stuff, I see no reason to copy it. Mm -hmm. I want to um, have it live in 21st century. And this is my way of doing that. So space boobs in space. Um, it is uh, all short films that we made over the course of like a year or two. And um, these things usually get played at our film festivals that we do here in Athens. And it's my way of sharing them with everybody else, packaging them together, archiving it. Um, and that's why the anthologies exist. But what we, yeah, are definitely working toward each year is our, our yearly show that we put on. And so when you watch a movie like Space Boobs in Space, that wasn't some like epic idea. It's just our <laughs> way of putting it together so that if you do not live in or near Athens, Georgia and cannot come see Gonzorific, um, that's our way of uh, not only sharing that with you, but um, we are able to then through sales of DVD and through streaming. Um, it's not a lot of money but it is enough to keep it going. Yeah. Well, I was, I noticed, I mean, space boobs in space, especially the wraparound in that uh, you had uh, makeup in there. You had some uh, effects in there, you know, I mean, uh, you could tell there was production uh, put behind it as well. Uh, you know, and, and like you said, the support and, and the money you do make uh, does help at least with some of that. You've got a little behind the scenes of some of the, uh, actresses uh making their own costumes <laughs> yeah they do it's incredible no it's really i don't want i want people to know it's a group effort and I, I i feel like putting these things out really shows that it is and you see kind of all the people involved and uh i yeah i i really just um it it is it is definitely not just me i, I but i also as a male filmmaker could very well have chosen to tell my own little stories I want to make a film about my heart being broken or I want to make a film about being angry or I want to make a film that gets back at all the people to bully me. I'm going to show a lot of violence. Or I want to make a movie that's, you know, just as super cool as the ones I like where the guy with the gun runs around and shoot people. Or I want to, you know what I mean? Or mm -hmm. but I don't, uh, I'm not interested in that point of view. I don't want like my experience as a male or as a fan of film processed, you know, like marketed to male point of view or, or celebrated by men. I don't want to echo that back out, you know, and I don't want that like repackaged and sold to me. Um, I would like to hopefully if I'm making things put out something out there that is not available elsewhere and is not being made similarly by other people. And um, just, you know, going by the people in my life and the artists I know, it's been kind of a no-brainer to do it this way. Yeah, and it, it also doesn't mean that you hate guys. You know, I mean, I think people have that idea of, oh, these are feminist movies, so you're going to bash guys, when mm -hmm. that's not what you're doing. You're trying to break norms. Yeah, no, no. If 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 a guy if a guy feels like attacked <laughs> by what I'm doing, <laughs> I think that's like a counterattack. Sure. <laughs> it, it. I would say, I would say definitely. Um, if I didn't make it clear earlier, dudes, I'm doing this in hopes of taking you out of the cave. You know what I mean? I'm doing this to 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 hopefully make the future a little bit better. Uh, I, I want you to like see uh, women as uh, your equal. I want you to see women for all their incredible qualities. I don't want you to go like, wow, what a beautiful image of this beautiful woman. I want you to be like, my God, she's funny. My God, she's talented. Look at all the stuff that she can do. And uh, also when your buddies are being total garbage, to be the one to stop them and to speak up and say something, you know? And so, um, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to be, I don't even think I'm an ally. I think I want, I think I'm an accessory. That's how I like <laughs> nice. myself, accessory. Mm -hmm. It's a good way to put it. Now it's understandable, you know, how it's tough to break those norms when you have space boobs in space 
and on Amazon, they have the recommended films. And I just recently watched this again before the interview, uh, the space moves in space. Uh, and they had the recommended films. If you watch this, uh -huh. these films, do you want to hear what they had? Oh yeah, man. Tell me, dude. And I also want to know what you thought about it. Uh, so first they had, they had MILFs versus zombies. They had mm. nudist colony of the dead. Ooh. Beach babe bingo. Yeah. Full moon of the virgins. Phoenix okay. warrior. Yeah. Monster safari. Yeah. Bigfoot horror camp. Bigfoot's weekend and evils of the night. Dude, I'll tell you this. The, um, virgin, what's it called? Virgin full moon of the virgins. <laughs> That's, I think, the Devil's Nightmare or Dracula. That's about vampires. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah, I love that movie. <laughs> <laughs> That's got this great red ring that the vampire wears. Oh, and oh, there, yeah. I oh, I played that that for the cast of Bad Girl Dracula when we were shooting um, the Bloody Brides of Bad Girl Dracula just a few months ago. We all watched that. <laughs> so so those are the films that you know are recommended with this and okay just, i'll take it you know I, I found that kind of interesting i'm like okay <laughs> you know i mean some of them i'm like wondering were these recommended because of their titles alone um you know i don't i don't know i think the people that are watching those movies look at something like what i do and we're like well this is going to be like that too when in, in all reality when you submit a movie to a play or anything, when you sub when you upload a video to YouTube, don't you pick genres a little bit? Don't they give you like a set parameters of well, is this? And on Amazon, they let you pick like three categories your movies in, mm -hmm. and there's like comedy, but there's like tiers of comedy, so you can do all three comedies and be like slapstick, political. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I always pick gay and lesbian because, like historically they've been like the biggest like supporters of underground and makers of underground and cult film. They will definitely appreciate uh, the, the heavy influence of, uh, of, of someone like John Waters or Dave Dakota or, uh, you know, the, the screen queen era or right. any, you know, any of the old kind of schlock um, they will certainly appreciate that. But I don't think, someone looking for those movies now uh like you know with gay characters or you know queer characters are necessarily gonna happen upon my movies and i wish they would <laughs> it is a shame because yeah space boobs in space uh yeah i dug it man uh the shorts you had in here were great um you know you've got the most creative use of the game of operation <gasps> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, operate. Sometime over the years I forget which movies are were made which year, so I forget which collection they're on. Yeah. Space Boots in Space has operate. Yeah. Oh man, yeah. That was it's a great setup and a great, you know, a, a hook and I I loved that. And then uh your killer deal as well uh with Lola uh Le Soleil. Yes. Oh, Lola is a award-winning burlesque performance it was uh, an honor to get her in that thing oh man she's amazing that was just i i would put i would like lola to be in every movie that i make i was so i was i was nervous i was like i so want this to be worth her time you know what i mean yeah yeah and she seemed to be having fun with it did was that a lot of that was improv or was that scripted at well, all Dude, let me. It was scripted. It was written. I believe D was the screenwriter on yeah. that one, as well as the director. D flowered. My, we call it. I, I refer to us as two lion Voltron. That's our <laughs> dynamic. Um, Lola just sort of you know someone like that, and a lot of the burlesque people. The thing is, they are used to building characters. They are used to making things. They are used to sewing things. They're used to building things. It's so hands-on. It's so creative. You just get out of the way of it and make it look as you, you know, do it justice with your lighting, your camera and all of that. And she came out of the back room. And she was that character. Mm -hmm. And she had this wig that would do this crazy hair flip in her face. And she's like, I'm Charlie Powers. And she just started rattling off this whole spiel like she was in a commercial. <laughs> it was amazing to me. This is the level of artist that I work with. 
yeah, it, she was pretty amazing in it. And then you have a uh, horror <laughs> horror hands in here. Uh, you got some fart humor. Uh, I oh, love my favorite. I enjoyed horror heads quite a bit. The whole sh thing with the music, you know, it, it, and it's stuff like this that I love because it's, it's such a simple, it, it, it's, it's a simple concept. If you look at it at its core, but it's so effective and it works so well. And it, it got a huge laugh out of me with the horror hands with, with the music. Yeah. Well, you, you're a critic of the whole jump scare, uh, music cue, loud noise, uh, trope in horror movies. And we've talked about it before. Mm -hmm. And that was my way of a, 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 a great, the greatest thing about making short movies rather than doing features, which I've done one and it took a year of my life, but it was so restrictive. I instead loving, I love like just having a concept you don't need to try and make a long story out of it. If you have an idea that's like literally 11 seconds and that's all you've got, you're good. Make it. That's it. It's a movie too. It's a real movie. Don't let anyone tell you it's not horror hands. All I had was an idea that someone was in a horror type situation. And it's just like when they pick up the phone and loud noise, but everything she touches makes a loud noise. And we didn't have an ending, so I had that same actor. We did a split screen. It's her in the Scream costume, too. Oh, it is. I thought that. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, it is. I was like, you know what? I'm big influenced by the Muppets. Everybody knows this about me. All my big influences are short, for the most part. My, my core influences are all short things. Music videos, growing up on MTV, watching Saturday Night Live since 1987, uh, Pinwheel, Sesame Street. All these things are short subject based all they're all sketch based and and even sitcoms those are all like kind of hard wired with me and so i'm like well in the end of the muppets usually if they didn't know what to do they had someone explode or be eaten <laughs> or dance yeah so i'm like god having that tag of a fart uh you know that's kind of my way of doing that and who doesn't like a fart? you know farts are spectacular i have a library a sound library of hundreds of different farts and I still end up usually making my, my own new one almost every time. Like just get in the mic and go. <laughs> so I'm like sitting there sifting through all these farts. I'm like, it's been 10 minutes and I can't find the perfect fart. Let me just, you know, what, is, what am I doing? I had some Taco Bell today. Give me a minute here. No. <laughs> yeah, really? Have we, Yeah, we've had real farts in some movies. Yeah, we have. <laughs> we had a fart. Oh, I was just watching it today because um, uh, one of the, projects i'm putting together i've got an old film that's been out of circulation for many years i think it may be on funny or die still as a film called two in the pink and as a romantic comedy a blind date with these two women and there's a scene in the film where they're in a pool of jello together a baby pool full of jello and one of them the one wearing the pink polka dot bikini farted while they were sitting in the jello the sound it made was amazing it was like a whale song <laughs> <laughs> great now i won't ever hear whale song quite the same way again it just had this choked like oof, kind of i don't know i can't do it you're just gonna have to wait <laughs> you have to have to check it out yes um, <laughs> fart sounds but yeah and also with your space moves in space i think it's the first time i've seen fangs come out of a butt cheek yeah um, i mean yeah see you know, I've seen I've seen uh, you know a, a, a toothy mouth come out of an anus out of uh, the ass zombies <laughs> movie. Yeah, and, and and let's not forget Rabbit with Marilyn Chambers, the yes, and movie, Rabbit the mm -hmm. armpit fang or whatever. Yes, um, that was called Lap Dance in the Gates of Hell, and I wanted to do a vampire thing, and so we had this whole cool group of vampire uh, ladies and. You know, a couple of just, you know, I don't know what. <laughs> I, I told them to be fly girls from <laughs> in Living Color. That was the direction I gave them with the wardrobe and everything. I wanted also one to only speak French, but she sort of kind of did. I don't know. So I, I got the script and I get to the part where, and I don't, I, I'm not spoiling anyone for anything. You guys, um, a character gets bitten on the ass by a vampire and only her ass becomes a vampire, not the rest of her body. I got to that point in the script 
And I'm like, ah, now I don't know how to end it. Where do I go from here? I sent it off to my buddy, Mode Me Show. She's a, a incredible filmmaker in Canada. And uh, her feature is called Dis, but I cannot remember what they retitled it for streaming. Yeah, I forgot what they called it too. I, I, I it's I think this was like, like at the door or something yeah. like that. Yeah, that's what it is. Dis at the door. Yeah, and so I mode Quirk Films. She's the best. I sent her. I've done this more than once. I sent her the script. I'm like, mode. Where do I go from here? I have a character bitten on the ass, and her ass turns into a vampire. And she's like, Andrew, that's it. That's the <laughs> mic drop. She's like, you were done. The script is over. <laughs> So it became then a matter of like, how do you show someone's butt be a vampire and how would it bite someone? And the crew just loved figuring that out. And I have a great picture of the gluing teeth to Coquette's butt. And um, then later that great shot of the woman who gets bitten and she has that butt cheek print right mm-hmm. with the two holes. Oh, Fantastic, you know, fantastic. Boom, done, mic drop, roll credits. There you go. I, you know, I know, you know, if you're going to make stuff, you know, you, there's a couple different ways you can go about it. You can be like, I want to hone my craft until I'm just as good as J.J. Abrams or any of these people I really love, Alfonso Cuaron. Uh, that's a way to go. And you're going to make a great reel and someone's going to hire you. But I'm like, you know what I never seen before? <laughs> now that it's in my head, I badly want to see it happen. You know, just so... Constantly by this, you know, yeah. what if this happened, uh, how would you do that? Let's figure this out. I want to shoot this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I did. And with the operation operate, I literally um, won that in a, a door prize at work, an operation game. And I'm like, well, I know what I'm doing with this. It vibrates. <laughs> Which is one of two vibration references in uh, Space Boobs in Space, by the way. The other is in uh, the lap dance short with uh, they make a reference to vibrating phones. Oh, um, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, there's also a reference to Bubble Guppies, the kids show. Yes. Uh, because she talks about there being a skeleton under your skin, you know. Mm-hmm. And yeah, he, guppies comes from having a kid and watching those shows, and I'm like it just next thing you know, my wife is who reads all my scripts. Um, she was just like, "Well, there's bubble guppies." Like, oh, right. <laughs> no shame in my game, of course. <laughs> no, but and again, though, everything in the film, it feels like people are having fun, and from the talk tonight, I hope people realize, you know. I think there's this thing too where they think everyone who makes a film is thinking is trying to be Abram Spielberg or whatever, but it's not true. A lot of indie filmmakers like yourself are just wanting to make something, not necessarily be the next Spielberg. But I think people yeah. think that. And when you have a film that's aware and people are into what type of film you're making, you can tell it's just fun. It's got a great spirit to it. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, uh, once upon a time, eh, when video stores were new, and would you agree that streaming sites are basically taking the place of that? Yeah, um, you would, uh, especially in the early days, there was a lot of really weird stuff in there. It wasn't all just like Hollywood and the major indies on the shelves. Um, I remember renting uh something like Blood Feast or Laser Blast, and uh, you know, Black Devil Doll. Stuff like that was actually in the stores. And, you know, some people did rent it and go, what is this garbage? But other people rented it, and now they're, like, making documentaries and writing books about it. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Maybe because they're important, and they're good, and there is an audience for those who will appreciate them. All you can really do is stop making excuses and make something. My biggest thing is, you know, don't rah rah me. Don't like celebrate me. Don't like try to, you know, get into it or whatever. I want you to know that you can make movies and there's no excuse. Like, really, if I can do it, because I wouldn't say I've mastered any aspect of film production. <laughs> I just want to know enough about all of it to one, 
not have to ask for help in completing my movie from end to end and two to be really dangerous <laughs> and i think that sums up uh, a body of gonzorific work for sure is uh, trying to do both those things so i think you get get those ideas across well in your uh in your product and in, in your productions and uh, the art that you make uh, though not everyone online <laughs> would agree probably i imagine you get some very interesting comments out on the interwebs as we all do what they say don't read the comments <laughs> uh yeah they do uh and uh yes and uh wreck, wreck it ralph also says don't read the comments um it is true that some people have some awful things to say but i think a lot of people are just online to be their worst self um and um a lot of people you know a lot of men have seemed to feel ripped off um on amazon prime where uh my movies are being mostly watched uh because prior to that it was mostly through dvd sales and film festivals where collectors and fans of underground film are going to see them and buying them this is the first time really that my movies have been available to people that aren't seeking out um on purpose micro budget and underground these people are just looking at a cover and you know bringing whatever garbage it is they've got uh, to that and then accuse me of yeah misleading them with a title like dr humpenstein's erotic castle or whatever I'm like they, it kind of blows their mind. And so, yeah, there's a lot of uh, one star reviews and, you know, I, I, I know where they're coming from and I understand why they react the way that they do. And, you know, with my history in music, I've, I've had things thrown at me. I've had someone sit through my entire, my band's entire set with their back to me and flipping me the bird 45 minutes straight. Holy I've shit. had someone tried to light my leg hair on fire. I've been hit with a roll of quarters, not quarters, pennies. It would have been rad if it was quarters. I was gonna say that's like ten bucks right there. Shit. Yeah, no, I'd be like, please throw more. Um, I yeah, I've, I mean, it it. So having someone say something on the internet, the thing that, the th the one that bothers me, the one I really take issue with, is not that them going like, oh, this person has no talent. Oh, I could make a better movie with my toenails. You know, I, eh, whatever. You know, I've I I understand. I've heard it. They don't they don't know. Um, what I get upset is when they're attacking the crew when they're attacking the physical appearance of the women in the films. Mm -hmm. uh, it, but it also proves my point and validates the fact that I should be making the movies that I'm making with the people that I'm making them with. And yes, have them out there because while these men refuse to uh, evolve, why these men, ref you know, refuse to, to uh, drag themselves into the new century and uh, still think that all entertainment is being made for them and are, you know, very upset that not everything is put in this sexualized package that is like, please, you know what I'm saying? I don't want, I don't want their money. I don't want their attention. I'll take the negative reviews because all it means is more clicks on it for me. So, <laughs> you know, 62% one star reviews. Well, God, if, even if there's 80 well, one star reviews, there's 80 reviews versus like two on something else, you know? Um, the movies of mine that are reviewed the best on Amazon have been watched the least. Huh? Yeah. Because there's like, you know, four, three star reviews or whatever, or uh, three, four star reviews, but there's only three reviews, but the ones that have, yeah, been dragged across the coals for whatever reason. Yeah. They're the most popular because and they're, you know, they're in the queue, they're visible. So it all equals a popularity, but, um, I I'm not making these. Yeah, I'm 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 not making these for them. I'm hoping that they will listen to what I say and see what I'm doing. And the fact that I exist and that it has upset them enough to write about it, it tells me that I've hit a nerve, you know, um, because it isn't just the random. This is a piece of crap movie. They take it. They take it like a a personal. <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> They're upset that it ex has the audacity to exist. Mm -hmm. And if you think that is going to make us want to stop, it's the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it, yeah, but it does upset me though. Cause no one likes to hear somebody be critical of their physical appearance. You know, nobody likes that. And so if I was going to respond to any reviews, um, 
I would like to come to those people's house and talk to them about why they wrote that. Yeah. Do do a good old uh, Jay and Silent Bob Strikes Back thing where they've got their oh, list. Of, them up. Yeah. They got their list of critics and they just go to everyone's house. Yeah. Well, you know, these guys are oftentimes fans of movies where uh, the women are not really characters. They're more mm-hmm. of just kind of objects and window dressing. And they're fans of movies oftentimes where women are murdered mm-hmm. and uh, taken apart. And uh, there's a big fan base for entertainment like that. I refuse to uh, I refuse to do it. I'm not do it. I have not had a female character uh, die in one of my movies in a, like a very long time or be murdered or whatever. You know, I've had ghosts, I've had zombies, but I've not shown, you know, like the the the, the killing of them. Um and that was definitely on purpose. And so I I think that someone like Amazon who is uh, now censoring low budget movies. My movie, Dr. Humpenstein's erotic castle was on there for a year and then put behind an adult filter suddenly, <laughs> which I really don't understand. There is not a drop of blood. There is not a, um, severed limb. Uh, there is not a aerial or a nipple. There is not a, uh, a, a genital shot, none of that stuff. And so it just, it's a testament though, to the power of, um just in general like brazen body positivity is what Hummenstein is and i went around with their sensor board um asking them to please take a look at the film and i was like you know it has like sexy stuff in it but it's not meant to uh you know arouse the viewer it is not meant to like i this isn't like an adult movie for that that's the movie is making a clear point about that stuff instead i felt all everyone that's seen it it's my most like literal you know it's the most honest i've and upfront Mm -hmm. and literal i've ever been about like what would be our mission and about why i'm doing this stuff and yeah they insisted it had persistent erotic themes and therefore was adult in nature after a year it was it was it would have been safe for instagram come on man (laughs) (laughs) but but yeah it just gives you there are a lot of double standards there's a lot of backwards crap um but uh, ultimately yes um men are confused and angry and afraid and freaked out not by the things that should freak them out which is things about like you know rape torture violence against women things like that, homophobia, all these things that those YouTube channels get a free pass. Um, and a lot of those movies do too. Uh, they, they are then they're, they're instead, uh, upset about a, uh, a woman who, um, is not a, uh, you know, a Victoria's secret cover model or whatever, mm-hmm. um, having the audacity to, uh, to wear lingerie or something like that. How dare they? <laughs> it's great. I say that jokingly. I don't. It doesn't bother me. And I love. No, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. So it, yeah, it do, it doesn't compute. It fries their brain, and they flip out. And instead of, you know, it's that fight or flight. I. <laughs> but again, it just fuels the the fire. It makes me. You know, um, my the first like indie film I was ever aware of as a kid was uh, Easy Rider. It was like my dad's favorite, like number one movie. He had a big he made a poster out of the movie ad when it played Atlanta. He like mm-hmm. scanned it at work or made it in his, he worked at a print shop. This was, you know, the seventies. He turned it to a blow up into a huge poster. And I memorized every word on this ad. I memorized the names of the theaters. I memorized the names of the critics that the reviews were on can film festival. I didn't even know what that was. All I knew is that this movie was rebellion. This was a uh, nonconformity. And that th- it was a big deal and it was important. And so I know that um, that kind of stuff rattled the cages of movie industry. And what we do is definitely rattling the cage of a uh, culture that has been, I feel, wronged by uh, that establishment because they make a lot of money off of you. Well, man, what businesses would collapse if you no longer thought, you were ugly and fat and smelly. Yeah. 
<laughs> <laughs> a lot of places would close. I mean, yeah. a lot of things are like, you know, it's like, hey, you're losing your hair. That's wrong. Mm-hmm. Nah, maybe no. Everybody loses their hair. Well, uh, well, you, your teeth aren't, your teeth aren't bright white. Whose teeth are bright white? If a guy smiled at me and his teeth are bright white, I wouldn't believe anything he said. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you, 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 you've, have, you've got a stomach. Your, your stomach comes. So my, I've, I've got a. Okay, so what what should I do about that? Oh, I have all these things to sell you. Well, wait, wait, you trying to sell me something, or do you something wrong with my stomach? Well, nothing's wrong with your. Oh, oh, you know what I mean. Yeah. So it, it to me just we like to blow the lid off of it if we can. I think uh, art doesn't always need to do that, but there's room for art that does, and I think it's necessary. Well, I hope you continue to rattle the cages and carry the flame and make these films uh, that are necessary because I enjoy them. And I know many people out there that do enjoy them. Uh, And uh, I think we'll wrap it up here for the night. And uh, I appreciate your time here tonight, Andrew. Uh, I hope this gave people some perspective and some interest in your films. And we've mentioned it, that they're on Amazon. Uh, Why don't you go ahead and uh, just plug real quick where they can find your stuff at. Well, that's right. You can find many of them on Amazon.com slash V, as in Vagina Victory, slash Gonzorific, G-O-N-Z-O-R-I-F-F-I-C. And I want to reiterate that these movies are not made with a lot of money. These movies are not made with fancy, expensive equipment. This is all stuff that's been done, and you can probably tell a lot of times. This is all stuff that's done in our homes in our in and around town out in the street out in the woods we are not hollywood we are not indie this is you can do it too so you know there's a great interview with robert altman where they asked him what are your influences and he goes "My, my biggest influences i don't remember the names of those movies because i thought they were awful and i knew i could do better so by all means if you see my stuff and you think i'm terrible and you could do better go make a movie send me the link but if you want to know how any of this stuff is done, my email address is in the movies. It's on the website. It's on all the stuff. Gonzorific at gmail.com. Ask away. I'll tell you exactly what it was filmed on, exactly how much money it cost, how long it took, the mixture of the, you know, whatever fake body fluid or thing. We use. I'll tell you absolutely anything. There's no mystery here. I'm not competing with anyone. And I'm definitely um, not afraid of uh, anybody else trying to do this because I would love to see someone come along and make movies like this too. It would honestly make me feel a little bit better about, about the future. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Andrew, uh, the lovely Andrew Shearer folks, uh, make sure you check out his stuff and uh, we appreciate you so, uh, stopping by here, Andrew. And uh, we'll just, I guess we'll just say good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. <laughs> See, a fart gets you every time. Yeah, I get farts you every time. Hey, all my friends out there looking for more spoiler room goodness? Then why don't you check out our brand new Patreon page, patreon.com slash specialmarkproductions, where you can get access to exclusive spoiler room episodes and a whole lot more. You can also find us on Facebook groups at SMPRD and on to Twitter at Special Mark Pro. Let your voice be heard and let us know what you would like to see in the spoiler room, as well as just how we're doing in general. We appreciate your support and remember in the spoiler room that conversation is fresh, but we do spoil the movies.